So anyway, so I'm Janine Hampton, um, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I don't, I may be the only Lieutenant Governor who's a ham, I'm not sure about that. I know I'm the only Lieutenant Governor with a, with a satellite in her office. I know that for sure, pretty much. Um, but I've um, been in office less than a year, and I got, hello there, how are you? Good to see you. Um, actually, my husband is a ham too. My husband is retired Air Force. I actually met him in the military, and he's the reason I got interested and getting my license because he was already a ham and he hung out with other hams. You know, there was the the uh, the meeting every Saturday morning down at the Greasy Spoon uh, restaurant. Um, it was and it was all older guys and they were they, you know they and they all had all kinds of equipment and you know I'm a, I'm an engineer by degree. I have an industrial engineering degree and I like tech stuff. So it was I was drawn to it, absolutely drawn to it. And, but this was back in the 80s. This is when my interest first got peaked about, about being uh, a ham, an amateur radio operator. And, but back then, you may or may not remember, um, you had the, the, there was the code part. And so I was, I knew I could pick up the material part. I knew that, especially with an engineering degree. But it was picking up the code that was kind of challenging. And so I had been teaching myself code on and off over the past few years. And I still, I think I still have the app, or I think I may have taken it off. I had an app on my phone um, to teach, to help you learn the code. And I've decided I wanted to learn it anyway, and, but I took, I've since taken that app off. But here's but what I learned, though, that it's better to, at least for me, to learn at a faster speed than at a slower speed. Because I was doing five words a minute, seven words a minute, and it just, it's too slow. And sometimes I think when you go faster, your brain just adapts and you just, it's almost instantaneous. So, but that's, that's, um, that's on the bottom of my list is to do, I have a long list of things I have to get to after I'm done with public service. It, it keeps growing. Um, well, like I said, I met, so I met my husband um, who was a flight surgeon in the Air Force. He retired. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know, I've been married 16 years to Doyle. Um, our home is in Bowling Green. We, um, I think between the two of us, we've lived in, we've been stationed in nine states. We've lived in nine states and it was actually a job offer that got me to Bowling Green. Uh, I spent 19 years in the corrugated packaging industry, um, cardboard boxes to the lay person. And uh, I had a sale, I was actually in up, living in upstate New York and I had a sales job. And uh, when I, the year I finished my master's degree, uh, an offer came out of the blue to come to Bowling Green. And so that's how I got to Bowling Green. Uh, but interestingly enough, when I was living in, in, in New York State, in upstate New York, uh, I ran up, the plant that I ran was 30 miles from the Canadian border. So it was really cold in the winter, really, really cold. And there was an ice storm in the 90s in that, in, in that uh, I think it was, uh, it was Watertown, New York, an ice storm. And the only person who could, I mean, it knocked out communication, it knocked out power. My plant was without power for two weeks. And we, our plant had a rule, or the insurance company had a rule that uh, somebody had to stay in that plant when there was no power. And I was the only one who could get there. I couldn't even reach any of my anybody who worked for me. And when the, once they cleared the freeway, I was the only one who could get there. And I have never been so cold in my life. I, you know, I had layers on. I had, uh, you know, I had long johns on, and you know, I'm sitting there huddled in the office with my flashlight. But I was, I had a ham radio, and I was, uh, you know, portable two meter, and I was listening to the emergency operations. They kicked in in upstate New York, and they were doing exactly what they do uh, in an emergency. They were passing traffic. They were uh, they were helping the emergency people. They were helping the helping law enforcement. They were helping businesses. It was I thought it was really really cool. And so I've just had an interest in the emergency part of of amateur radio. Um, uh, do you, does, does everybody here get uh, the A, the, um, the uh, QR, QST magazine? But the um, article they did on the, in, on the aftermath of the 
marathon, the uh, Boston Marathon bombing. Did you read that? That was a few. This was a few years ago. Really good article. Of course, they were there working the race. They and they and they, I mean, they had a pretty big operation too, and a tent, huge operations already set up. And when the bombs went off, they shifted immediately to emergency response mode. And the article talks about their response. Uh, in the aftermath of that bombing. And that's what I'm interested in. Uh, that, for some reason, uh, over the decades, I just keep hearing, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, emergency, be prepared for emergencies. Um, after 9-11, and I was in, living in Syracuse uh, uh, during 9-11 and a few years after that, I told my husband, I, I was convinced that the next hit was going to come to the power grid. And having lived through an ice storm and, and slept in a very cold plant, I told my husband I never want to be that cold again. So I said, let's get a generator. And my husband said, we don't need a generator. And I said, all right, I'm just, I went on about my business. But I just kept hearing, be prepared, be prepared. And I bring, I bring it up again. And my husband was saying, no, we don't need a generator. And I let it go again. And finally, one day, it was just, you know, I mean, you know whatever that inner voice is, it was just screaming by this time. And so one Saturday I said, I'm going to Home Depot to get a generator. Are you coming? <laughs> and we went and got one, and sure enough, within six months, um, we had a power outage. I think it was in the, the first time was in the winter time, and my husband had since wired up our furnace so that we could plug the generator in. We didn't, we didn't run it all the time, but it was just enough to take the chill off in the house. And then the other time it saved us was in the summertime, but it was a rainstorm. And for some reason, when they build the homes in Syracuse, New York, they have this odd drainage where they drain into the basement, into a sump pump, and then the pump pumps it out. And God help you if your power goes out during, during a rainy season. And sure enough, the, the power went out, and our basement would have flooded if we didn't have that generator. And then we not only did we help ourselves, we, we, we un disconnected it and wheeled it around to the neighbors and helped them pump their basement out too. So I'm just a proponent of being prepared. I'm a proponent of, of being able to shelter in place for at least two weeks. Uh, but part of that I know is communication. I know that uh, if something could happen to where all the standard communication uh, means are just gone. You know, people always assume their cell phones are going to work. They just assume that. Well, I got my cell phone. Okay, well, how are you going to charge it? Well, some people have, you know, the, um, uh, the solar chargers, but what if the cell tower, towers are down? What is, you know, you, what, what, is, what is your means of communication? And communication is probably one of the biggest, biggest uh, challenges, uh, the most important challenges in the aftermath of a, an emergency. So last year on the campaign trail, I, um, I, 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 assumed, I didn't assume we were going to win, but I said, i got to see Kentucky's Emergency Operations Center. This is the time to do it. I better do it now. In case we don't win, I may not ever get a chance to see it. And so I did. I went over to see it. And they, never, they really hadn't had anybody as interested in emergency preparedness, they told me, as when I visited. And if you haven't been there, you know, try to, try to see if you can get a tour. It's, it's amazing. Big room, as you might imagine, and the center is kind of the bridge. Uh, t giant TV screens all around, and they, they'll go to, I'll, I'll just call it DEFCON, they'll go to whatever level um, warrants, depending on the level of the emergency. And they told me there's always an emergency of some sort in Kentucky at some time. They said there's always flooding somewhere in Kentucky. But they don't, uh, bless you, Thank you, but they don't always uh, activate the, the operations center. Uh, depending on depending on the severity. So when we got 10 inches of snow, at least in Bowling Green last year, they activated. They were activated. So you know they're marshalling the snow plows and all these screens. They're monitoring different different things. They can see at a glance how many homes are without power. They can see there's another uh, one screen that actually you can see sort of the the, the power grid. Um, you can see what's down. Um, you, they've all around the room are desks with phones and microphones, and they have representatives from utilities and from uh, you know from emergencies from, uh, or the emergency uh, agencies from uh, for example from the private sector. Uh, the 
the Walmart is usually the first to get water into, in, into an area when it's needed. Uh, Walmart has a fantastic lo logistics operation. In fact, uh, for Katrina, right before Katrina, when they knew Katrina was going to hit, Walmart actually uh, marshaled trailers. They staged trailers around the U.S. and they actually had a war room for their, their logistics. And they actually were the first to get help into uh, the, to that area, to the New Orleans area. Uh, but logistics is what they do. You know, they move a lot of merchandise, and they're really, really good at it. And so, uh, if you get a chance to see the Emergency Operations Center, I hope you do. Uh, one of the areas that interested me, of course, was the radio equipment. They do have ham equipment. Uh, they have a call sign. The operations center has a call sign. They actually have a mobile truck that's just loaded with all kinds of radios and, and communications equipment. And so they're prepared to, to, uh, to interact with all kinds of, uh, all, different, all the different agencies, and, but, but ham operators are a part of that. And in some parts of the state, some of the, um, some of the ham clubs are more, more active than, than others as far as getting their, their members prepared for an emergency. Uh, I'm not so sure how prepared they are in Bowling Green. I know they were going through some of the training, some of the folks were, but I'm not sure that, but they don't, they don't really drill. I know the hospital, the hospital, Greenview Hospital in, in Bowling Green has the highest antenna. Got, if you're if you're a ham, you know where the high points are. The higher, the better is the rule. For in fact, I'm trying to sneak one into the dome at the Capitol, but don't tell anybody. So uh, we're actually going to tour the. We're going to you can take the tour up to the top of the dome, and we're going to be doing that on Wednesday or Thursday, I think. And I'm going to be scoping, uh, looking to see how I can sneak an antenna and run the cabling down because the the building people don't like you to mess with the architecture, you know, for historical reasons. But you know, if I sneak something in there. Anymore who's the wiser, right? Um, so, uh, but, but by all means, please visit the, the operations center, talk to the director, Michael Dawson. Um, he's always interested in, in knowing, uh, you know, who's going to interact, who will be the players uh, in an emergency. And they tell me that the biggest, the biggest threat to Kentucky is earthquake. Uh, the New Madrid Fault is overdue. Uh, it's overdue to go, and so uh, when it does go, I think they told us some of the counties in the west part of Kentucky uh, will be probably underwater, and so there's definitely going to be um, some issues um, around the state, and so hopefully you all get to be a part of the the, the uh, emergency net, the helpers, the people, and I tell people all the time. I said, you know, you need to find that guy in your neighborhood who's the ham because there's, you, if you drive around, you can find them. You can, you can still see the the person who has an antenna. Uh, maybe they even have the the TV antenna. Uh, you know, you could you can find um, you can find those people uh, and get to know those people because they'll. I tell, I say they will be the one getting the emergency traffic in and out. And I tell business that too. I tell, when I speak in front of a business, I always put a plug in for amateur radio operators, and I say you need to find the people in your business who are amateur radio operators because they will help you stay up and running during an emergency. And uh, it's funny, I, I was speaking somewhere one time and somebody said, oh yeah, Joe's a ham, and they just started rattling off people who were, who were ham operators, and, uh, and the... Uh, the, uh, the folks who ran the company thought that was a really good idea. They really did. But especially hospitals, they, you know, they, should, they should know. Uh, Greenview Hospital has some equipment. They don't really do anything with it. And even though they do drills, they, they'll do these practice drills you know, where there's some scenario there in Bowling Green. They don't do anything with the half club, which I think is, is wasting an opportunity because those folks are going to be involved. Uh, but I just, I don't know, for some reason, I, emergency preparedness is, is on my list of, of topics that I want to get to within the next 12 months, um, and probably sooner than that. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, because I didn't know what the lieutenant governor does, I get, it's a question I get a lot, what does the lieutenant governor do? And don't feel bad if you don't know, because I didn't know when Matt Devin asked me to be his running mate. And I had to go do some research. Um, uh, I went to Crit Llewellyn, Crit Llewellyn 
was the previous lieutenant governor. I went to her website. She did a lot of economic development announcements. And, uh, but, the, but the Constitution, the Kentucky Constitution, is our Bible for, for you know, it's our job description. And really, they don't say a lot about the lieutenant governor. So it's, it's really up to uh, whatever the governor and lieutenant governor agree upon. So as such, I have a long list of things. Uh, I, I didn't take this job to come in and sit down and in fact when Matt asked me to be his running mate um, I went back to him and I said now are you bringing me are you bringing me on to be a ribbon cutter or are you bringing me on to work and he said I, I, said, I said you know me you know me you know I'm hands-on you know I'm an engineer you know I like process improvement you know I love the private sector what are you, what are you bringing me on to do and he said I'm bringing you on to work and I said all right as long as we understand, as long as we, we, we agree on that, then I'm good. And so I've been working, I've had an opportunity to work on uh, entrepreneurship. I rolled out the, the first annual Lieutenant Governor's Entrepreneurship Challenge, which, are you still in high school? Yes. Are you in high school? It's open to high schoolers, uh, ninth through 12th grader, graders, whether you're you know, homeschool, private school, public school, and it's a pitch contest. So if you have an idea for a business, um, highly recommend you go to the website lgec.com and look up the rules. And you know it doesn't replace any of you know there's there's several pitch contests dotted around Kentucky. Um, Junior Achievement does their own pitch contest. Um, in fact, we partnered with them. Uh, the Kentucky Innovation Center does a pitch contest. We partner with them, although their contest is geared more for college students. And there's others dotted around. But we, we recommend you use them for practice. Go, if there's JA in your school, go through Junior Achievement. And, and you know, it's practice run for this contest because let me tell you what the prizes are. And I'll, I'll just contrast it. Junior Achievement's prize, top prize, uh, for their winning team, I think was $300 and a pizza party. Uh, but ours, we're raising money we're, um, from businesses, uh, and the, so far the pot is up to $100,000. And so the top three teams from, from across the Commonwealth will split that pot as well as their the winning coaches will also, there's going to be prizes for them because this only works if we get adult coaches in this. So entrepreneurship is one of the areas that's near and dear to my heart. So I get to work, I got to work on that. We just rolled that out. Um, space is near and dear to me. I grew up in the 60s. The first 10 years of my life were in the 1960s when they were, when NASA was, was launching something it seemed every other week and I would watch those and, and just dream. And it turns out Kentucky's largest export is aerospace and aviation. Most people think it's bourbon or horses or something like that. It's not. It's aerospace and aviation. And, it's, and it grew so much this year that Kentucky is now the, uh, we're ranked number two in aerospace and aviation in the nation. We're ranked second in the nation. Uh, and so it's just kind of grown organically and there really isn't any organization where those Players can talk and network and, and uh, you know discuss anything legislative that affects them. And so we started, or I helped start, I should say. And I keep saying we, but I'm not running this. I'm just an um, honorary non-voting member. Um, but my because of my enthusiasm for this arena, I helped. We helped start uh, a, a, a brand new organization that we're calling the Kentucky Aerospace Industry Consortium. And we just launched that last Wednesday, last week on Wednesday, which was October 5th, 5th which if anybody saw October, anybody here seen October Sky? You might seen that? Yes, Homer Hickam. Mm -hmm. uh, October 5th is the, the uh, date that he saw Sputnik when it was launched, when it was first launched. And, and, and it made him dream when he was a kid to be a rocket scientist, which he did, grow up to be a NASA, a rocket scientist at, at NASA, and um, and so and, and I almost got him here too for this. Um, um, he was going to come, but he had surgery this week because I actually met him earlier this year, and uh, so we launched at Moorhead State University. Dr. Malfris out there is so excited about this. In fact, he's chairman of the group, and we launched a rocket. 
we lodged a rocket. They built, they, I wish I could show you the controller, but they built a controller, specially tailored controller with three buttons on it. So the governor pressed one, I pressed one, and Dr. Malfurst pressed one, and we actually launched a rocket, and it was really cool. So that's when I think this job is really cool. <laughs> it's just so much fun. And so I get to do, I get to work on, uh, on issues that are in line with, with the governor's agenda, but it's just to, to help Kentucky be better than it is. And one of my favorite things is talking to kids. Uh, I've been asked to share my personal story with, with students of all ages. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Detroit, um, was born and raised in poverty, uh, but still my three sisters and I are all first generation college. Um, and it's just been an interesting, successful story despite those humble beginnings. And uh, so I share my story with kids and, and talk about the route that I've had, the unconventional route. And everybody's route is uncon unconventional, I think. You know, you can plan and it's not gonna, life's not going to happen that way. It's really, that's what I tell kids. You may have a plan. Don't be shocked if it changes. Don't be shocked or disappointed if it changes. And I talk, but I talk about the decisions in my life, the decision to, uh, you know, I worked my way through college because, you know, my parents couldn't afford it. I talk about joining the Air Force, uh, serving in the Air Force for seven years. I talk about the box industry. And I had a fourth grader ask me why on earth did I go to work in something as boring as boxes. Fourth graders are brutally honest. They, they really are. Uh, but, they have, uh, and they, but their questions are good, are good ones. And I just explained it was the lure of manufacturing, was the joy of manufacturing and, and that environment that I loved. And, uh, but I didn't stay there as a supervisor. I eventually rose to, um, to plant manager. And so I talk about these things and talk about how I got here, you know, the, the unconventional path that got me here. This is only the second office I've ever run, uh, run for and the first time I won. So it's the same thing for Matt Bevan. So for both of us, it's unusual. Uh, but we're both from the private sector. Uh, both have a, a, a joy of being around other people. And if you ever meet him, you, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. He just has a zest for life that's infectious. It really is infectious. And we're here to serve. We are truly here to serve. And so I enjoy, uh, you know, my, my schedule uh, has been, my schedule this side of the election is, is just as grueling as it is on the other side, of the, on the campaign side of the election, because I'm, I'm basically still doing the same thing, which is going out and seeing what's going on in Kentucky. And I would rather go out and see what's, and talk to people face to face instead of st sitting behind a desk. I, I really don't like sitting behind a desk, which is why I enjoyed sales so much. Um, uh, but I really enjoy this. So, so I, think, I think I'm on a mission to try to get Kentucky to just be a little bit better prepared for emergencies so there's not a run on Kroger like there was um, when there was going to be uh, snow coming. Uh, I, I made the mistake of just going to Kroger uh, the day before snow was coming. It's my regular day to go shopping. And I have a picture of my mom standing at the poultry counter, and it is there's it's empty, it's completely empty. And apparently everybody was making chili because there was no ground beef, and the, the canned tomato section was decimated, and it was it was kind of funny, and you know there was just an air of desperation in the store that shouldn't be there. You know we should prepare, be prepared. Uh, you know we could we should be able to shelter in place for two weeks. You know yeah. I think we could go a while longer than that at my house, you know, given all the canned goods and dried pasta and, and bottled water, you know, and, and, and not to mention the communications equipment. So, um, you know, the, and the uh, extra propane tanks and charcoal and, you know, so I think we're good to go, but I, I just don't think people think about, they're just not thinking that far ahead. And I just want them to think far ahead because if they're not desperate, they're being in a better position to help other people. Uh, and I think that's the big thing is, you know, I heard horror stories, the uh, ice storm that hit in Kentucky a few years ago uh, was actually in my sales territory out, out Princeton way. And I heard, I just, when I got back out into the field, I heard horror stories of, you know, fights at gas stations and, you know, when the Walmart opened, <laughs> fights at the Walmart. And it's like, that just shouldn't be, you know, I just, you know, just, let's just try to minimize that. So. Um, so I am, I am an extra class, um, I, this, is, this is my vanity call sign, uh, I actually want, and you know, the, 
I chose these for a reason. You know, I, I chose these signs for for a reason, and um, wow. I'm kind of legendary, in case you don't know, in the Bowling Green area because I took all three exams and aced all three, um, all three exams. Uh, but I just, I loved it. Uh, I took the tech and the general on the same day and passed those and then I um, st started studying for the extra. And boy, that's a miniature college course, isn't it? I mean, and it really is. And I, but I was so looking forward to doing, you know, just building my half shack and and just putting the equipment in and you know and starting to talk to people. And then Matt Bevan called me and and just told me wreck my plans. So there you go. Um, so unfortunately, all I have not had a chance in the two years I've had my license. I've not had a chance to really get into really get into being a ham. And all I have, sad to say, is a two meter handheld. That's all I have, and I think that's pretty sad, actually, for someone who is an extra class. I'm sure you guys all have like all kinds of cool equipment, and you can, you can talk all over the world. And and I'm trying to stay away from the computer part of things. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why. That you know, for for a former programmer, that would be really uh, interesting to get into. But I'm trying to just stay away from the computer and just go with the you know the hard equipment for now, anyway. So, uh, but it would be fun to get into. Um, I, would, I would really love to, to uh, make some connections from my office. Um, I'm going to sneak that in 10. I'm gonna, we're going to be scoping it out. <laughs> we're really going to be scoping it out. So I think I will stop there, and I would be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Just give me it all. you like you have a question. <laughs> Not about hams very much. Oh, well, that's okay. It could be about anything. I was just curious about your experience of, uh, you said you took the training for the public affairs officer, but you didn't get to go do that for mm -hmm. the Civil Air Patrol. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, that's just something I thought about doing a long time. It's interesting. You know, and the, and the reason they asked me uh, to do that, they, they had heard me speak when I was running for the House two years ago. Uh, they had heard me, you know, on radio and, and heard me and saw some of the things that I wrote. And plus, I'm, I'm, I'm prior Air Force, mm -hmm. and so they and they didn't have a public affairs officer, and so I was really looking forward to doing that. I really was, letting, you know, letting because they, they they do a lot of things. They 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 participate in a lot of exercises. In fact, now I, I still get the emails. They're helping uh, with this the aftermath of this hurricane. And the, the public doesn't even know about that. Bowling Green doesn't even know what they do. Yeah. And so I was really looking forward to sort of getting it out there, what they do, and, you know, and, and, you know that helps recruit more members um, mm -hmm. you know, to the, to the uh, squad. That's one of the, I think, the state's best kept secrets. It re uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of <coughs> best kept secrets in, in Kentucky and, uh, that Kentuckians don't know about. Kentuckians typically don't know about Kentucky's innovation centers, which if you want to start a business, that's where you go and they'll help you. They don't know that um, at Moorhead State University, they have a world-class space science program. It, and it's one of only five programs in the nation. And it's known outside of Kentucky. Dr. Malfres, who runs that, is, is well known. He is, he is very well known outside of Kentucky. But I mean, but I didn't even know, and I love space, and I didn't even know that was here until last year when I visited. I didn't even know it was there. So you know, there's there's a lot that's you know a best kept secret. Uh, a lot of our parks are just gorgeous, and uh, uh, you know, we we built um, money into the budget to spruce them up because some of them were in really bad shape. The the lodges were just horrible, and so we're sprucing that up because if we can get tourists here. You know that's that's um, that's income. That's low hanging fruit there, and so there's a there, Kentucky has a lot going for it, but um, uh, you know a lot that Kentuckians don't know about. So I'm out to do that too. I'm on a mission to do that, and I do talk about amateur radio wherever I go. I do. I'm trying to get people interested in this in in this hobby, um, but it's a practical hobby. It really is. So whenever I go, wherever I go, I do have my handheld when we're driving around. And one time I've actually found, because I, I have an app on my phone that will show, uh, the, show the repeaters, the closest repeater. And so I finally, one time I finally got somebody, I, mean, I think I was in Eastern Kentucky or something, I can't remember. But so two guys were talking, I, th I think it was two older guys, and I was going to break in and say hello. 
but I didn't because they were talking about their maladies and that just would have been, I think they would have been embarrassed to know that the lieutenant governor was listening to them talk about their maladies, you know, so, so I didn't do it. But, I was, but after weeks of trying to find somebody talking, I finally found somebody talking and I, could, I didn't have the heart to come in. <laughs> I just didn't. So, um, so hopefully you guys are more, you, you will be more active than I am. Um, and so, how far are you into the, the studies, the, the class so far? So your book looks way too new, there. There's, that, that looks, those pages don't, aren't even dog-eared yet. You've got to get them dog-eared. And, and, uh, you know. We're about two-thirds of the way Okay. The, the material. Okay. So we've got about six modules left to go okay. out of 18. Well, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I did, because I, I just devoured those those workbooks. I really did, mm -hmm. and, I, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but the, the extra class, I really did. That was boy, wow. That was engineering type stuff. And I was ready to go build antennas and you know you know go go sink the grounding rod for my system and, and just do all kinds of cool stuff. We went through antennas last week, so oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody actually, I told, I had mentioned to somebody that I wanted to build the antenna out of tape mm -hmm. measures. Somebody built one and gave it to me, and I said, "Well, I didn't want you to give me one. I wanted to build it myself, but I still have it, though." For some of us, that's the fun: is building it. Exactly. It's, it's not not so much operating as just putting together the equipment and getting exactly. the making it work. Exactly. And actually, I'm trying to remember. Did I get that? I'm trying to remember when we got home. Did I get that out of the trunk? I have to remember. I have to remember which vehicle it's in now, because I have because I have uh, four four different um, troopers, and so I'm not sure who. Somebody might have my antenna, but what is this? What, what is this? Uh, they won't have a clue what it is. They might turn it over to the hazardous. They might. Say, <laughs> what is this? What, what's our lieutenant governor doing now? So I'll tell you some of the. The fun stuff I've, ha I've got, had a chance to do, um, I've, I, I did a tandem skydive with the Army Golden Knights in June, oh which was, and, and apparently, if, if you're interested in doing this, they, they do this on a regular basis. It's, a, it's community outreach and it's sort of a recruiting um, thing for them. But the day that I did it, there were all kinds of people jumping. There, were, there was the mom of a recent recruit. Uh, there were some people from West Virginia, Ohio, um, and it was just, a, I think they were doing it two or three days, and, and when they, and, and you couldn't be in better hands. You could not be in better hands. You really couldn't. These guys are professionals. You know, as he's hooking me up, you know, the weird thing is I'm sitting on his knee, which that's kind of odd, but you know, you know, so he's hooking me up, but he's going through his checklist, uh, and he's saying it out loud. He was saying it out loud. And so we jumped, we flew up to 13,500 13, feet, and, uh, and, and, so, and you have a videographer, so there's a third guy who's just floating around you with the camera, he's got a GoPro camera on his helmet, and he's just taking video footage and photos, and then afterward you get, you get a disc. So if you're interested, I, if I were you, I would write the Golden Knights and tell them you're interested, and the next time they're in the area, we, we jumped at Fort Knox. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll probably call you and let you know because they, they had a wide range of people. And so when I got the invitation earlier this year, I went home and told my husband, I said, you'll never guess what I got invited to do. And he said, he said uh, can spouses come too? Which the Golden Knights tell me is unusual. Normally the spouses say, you're doing what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, um, they let him come and it turned out the day we jumped was our 16th wedding anniversary. So I have, we cannot top, I don't even know how we begin to top our anniversary celebrations after that, but that was just one cool thing we got to do. Um, we got to jump, I mean, we got to uh, go down in a, in a coal mine for the first time. I'd never been in one. We did that, you know, but you don't want to. Well, well, you know, it's, they're, they're a part of Kentucky, so I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to see one. I really had to see one, and we, it, was, it was interesting. I don't know that I could do that for a living, but... You know, my hat's off to them. I, I, I really respect what they do. I really do. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was different. It was different. So, I, you know, I get to do 
fun things like that, uh, just just to see what's going on in Kentucky. And, and I love going around to these small, these, especially these small towns, uh, and they tell us that no governor or lieutenant governor ever stopped in. I tell you what's really odd, you know, when, when Governor Bevan and I were sworn in last December, you know, we're the kind of people, we'll poke our head to an office and say hello to the people in there. People are, people were kind of stunned. They were like, oh, you know, they, they really were. And apparently, um, and, and this is a sad commentary on government in general, that the, the, the bar is so low for our elected officials that they're stunned when you talk to them. The first cabinet we visited was, was around, shortly before Christmas, um, the uh, uh, Health and Family Services Cabinet. And that's one of the largest, up, right up there with transportation. They have thousands of employees, but they gathered in the huge lunch room, and, and the governor spoke, and I spoke, and we took questions. And, um, and some ladies told me afterward, they've been there, they worked there for 20 years, and no governor or lieutenant governor had ever come just to speak to them. Just, just to speak to them. It just, it just doesn't happen. And so um, I, think, I think people are getting used to, to us. The governor has been known to, you know, he's jumped on a, uh, there, was a, there was a school bus, uh, some kids were visiting, and he jumped on us. He just jumped on the bus to say hello, or he'll pop out of his office, because his office is right by the rotunda, which is not good when there are protesters there. I'm back at the corner. Uh, if, you can hear the, if you can hear the protesters from my corner of the building, and they're pretty loud, but the governor has been known to just pop out and, you know, and, and join in whatever's there. You know, just to say hello to who's there, and so, and I really like that. I really enjoy that. I really do, because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a government of and by the and for the people kind of person. I'm a constitutionalist, and I believe government works best when we, the people, are active and engaged and informed. You know, it's one of the reasons I got involved in the Tea Party, and that's, I guess, that was really my introduction to government. Um, I got involved in the Tea Party down in Bowling Green. In fact, I remember. Uh, the very first wave of, of uh, rallies on Tax Day 2009, and in Bowling Green that evening they had one, and I remember a Dr. Rand Paul spoke, uh, and he was just, he wasn't running for anything, he just spoke, and I remember he spoke very eloquently about the Constitution and, and all that, and he was really good, and then the next year, of course, he decided to run for the Senate, and he cites that rally as, uh, as uh, spurring him to run for office. And of course, I got to know a lot of my elected officials by, you know, we were trying to figure out what they were working on and why they were working on it, you know, what bills, and, and so I thought nothing of just contacting my legislator or my congressman or my senator and asking questions. And I think, you know, you, you all have that right too. You have the right to ask me questions. You know, and I owe you an answer. You may not like my answer. I tell some people you may not like our methodology or our answer, but you at least we at least owe you an answer, an explanation, and not a tap dance to you, but and, but we owe you an answer, an honest answer. And uh, and I just think government works best when when people are engaged, and so many people have checked out, unfortunately. So uh, I think that was my introduction to to government, <laughs> and uh, and in fact that's how I met Matt was uh, I was part of a group that vetted him when he was thinking about running for the Senate uh, three years ago. And a uh, pretty, pretty detailed process, and uh, I was just really impressed with him then. Um, but uh, I, I have to say, I never saw this coming because this was not on my bucket list. Jumping out, skydiving, that was on my bucket list, but this was not on my bucket list. So uh, uh, very blessed, I'm very blessed. But are you sure you, you, you don't have any questions? You guys are, you're like high schoolers, because the high schoolers, take, they take a while to warm up with questions. First graders, no. First graders want to know, the first graders in Bowling Green want to know if I could do anything to get corn dogs back on the lunch menu. So they were pretty intense. They were, they were, and I didn't have the heart to lecture them about the perils of big government, you know, in your lunchroom, so I didn't do that. But, uh. The, uh, Field day is a long way off in June, mm -hmm. but if you're in town, oh my goodness, uh, the club does a pretty good field day set up with the, the local command post. Okay, it's, it's not quite the big blue truck, uh, <laughs> but uh, they do really well, and uh, it, 
it's a public location, but it's got a perimeter which would keep your security detail happy. You <laughs> operate for a little bit. And then if you're feeling frisky in Frankfurt, uh, when I was at Public Health, mm -hmm. we were doing the renovation of the operations center, uh, the state health operations center. Mm -hmm. So there's a 90-foot folded dipole at 275 East Main Street. Sweet. If you need to get to that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll tell you, I'm going to sneak over there. I'm going to figure out, I'll be scoping. We're just, I'm going on a tour. That's what I'm really doing. Well, uh, my car is at the top of the stairs there, the little blue one. It has an HF antenna on the back of it and an HF radio. So if you're interested in looking to see how that's done. Okay. <laughs> we'll get one put in all the cars. You should. All the Kentucky State Trooper cars, right? Trooper radio. We need some more radios in there. That's what we have. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? So I, I hope you all, and, you, know, you know, those of you who are, and so does, it, does everybody here already have their license and they're just working on No, okay, so you're new, you're brand new. Well, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you get, actually get into it. I, I would say just dive in and, and try not to let life take you away from it. Because my husband doesn't talk either. He's had his license for decades. And he, he never gets on at all uh, to do anything with it. Um, but I, but I, I have very fond memories of... Um, the, the group at the at the greasy spoon uh, Saturday morning for Saturday morning breakfast they would every morning they'd meet and uh, you know all these hams and a lot of them have passed away now but uh, you know that's what got my got me interested so I'm, I'm really glad to see you guys here <laughs> I'm really glad to see someone someone younger interested in it so it, you know it'll be fun to see what direction you take it because to you it's just a tool and then you'll take it and run with it and you probably do all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, so have fun. So I'm glad you're here. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you again for thank being you. here.